welcome back to This Is My Perfect Podcast. This week brought to you by Quarantine Haircuts. With me, I've got Perry and Kurt. What's up, guys? Hello, Swan. I've not seen you guys in like a whole two days because I dropped off some samples for this. That is true. Yeah, and even then, you basically just dropped and ran. Yeah, I, had, I just took a solid nap and uh, realized it was 8 p.m. and you guys were still awake. So I was just... <laughs> running (laughs) dropping those off but uh you also you also uh left me uh, a little little extra bourbon special oh yeah uh, yeah so you gave me some of the rebel yell uh tenure so that was nice yeah it's nothing like dropping off stuff at perry's house and leaving a pour on his front porch six feet away and then just hitting the road it's definitely a quarantine special i i was very happy about that i think i was about ankles deep into some antique 107 at that point so it was nice to have something else to (laughs) wet my whistle yeah no i'm uh i speaking of samples that i dropped off we've actually got a flying blind or for this episode we're going to be calling it flapping my wings without spectacles (laughs) (laughs) uh so it's uh it's gonna be a good one i have to pour it kind of off camera here because i i'm not as prepared as perry is uh but (laughs) Go ahead and let's get the uh, flying blind going. Ooh. Yeah, don't show us the bottle. Getting a lot of heat off the first couple whiffs. But once I... This is getting a very sweet tart kind of vibe. Yeah. It has a lot of sweetness to it in relation to a sweet tart or... uh, a pixie stick. I, yeah, like, yeah, I get that. That like loose sugary stuff on the outside of things. There, yeah. There's also a fruity note that I think is kind of leaning towards like watermelon or maybe even grapes, too. I have to not dig my nose into the glass. I have to kind of like rest it on top. It's a little ethanol heavy for you. Yeah. But... There's a I think it's a watermelon fruit note that you're kind of getting. There's a brown sugar note once I kind of dive into the nose too that I I like quite a bit. Yeah, I took a I took a sip of it. The brown sugar, it's definitely prominent. I do like that. Oh yeah. There's a lot of that brown sugar in there. Oh man. Brown sugar and citrus. Oh, it's pretty there's, good. There's like a really sugary, fruity note that gets into the, the kind of carries you into the finish. If you guys had to guess a proof, where would you be at? I would say. I'd be willing to bet one 100 to 110. It doesn't drink much higher okay. than, than a 110 proof. Yeah, I think I'm going to... I'm feeling more of a 90... I'm going to go a 98 to a 105. All I right. think you might have made a better better guesstimation there, Kurt. Yeah, Kurt's a little bit closer, yeah. but you guys are both really off. That's what's kind of surprising me. So I'll go ahead and show you what we're pouring right now. It's Hancock's President's Reserve. Whoa! Yeah, so it's actually coming in at 88.9. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is a liquor barn pick. I picked it up last year at one of the releases. They uh, always do this fun thing where you show up for something special, and then they like secretly throw things out at the counter as soon as the doors open. Uh, and this is one of them. So I've I've been um, there before where they put that out as like a consolation prize for some people who didn't yeah. get the the main release pour. So honestly, too, I don't know if I've ever had this. Yeah, it's different. It's one that like people don't really necessarily add to that Buffalo Trace listing of like I've got to have it. But after having it, this is my go to pour for uh, pairing with sushi. I think it's really Interesting. good. Okay. Yeah, I get that vibe. It has like a uh, it's bright 
but also kind of has like a ginger, like it complements with like a ginger mm-hmm. sort of it. Yeah, it works pretty well. Like I, I've noticed that if I get too high proof with like sushi or some of the kind of softer like rice heavy things, it just completely overpowers it. Everything is literally just bourbon with a little bit of whatever I'm eating. This is kind of a nice compliment to it. Yeah, it's delicate. Now, Swan, remind me, this is the same mash bill as Blanton's, right? I think so. I think it's the A. Uh, or what, that what would be it? Mash, bill, mash Bill 1. Mash Bill 2, then. Mash Bill 2, that's yeah. the high rye. So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty close, but I mean, you're, what, four proof points or so? Mm-hmm. Lower. But it's... Um, it's a pick, which I, I haven't been able to find one that's not a pick, which is weird with these. But they even put it on the outside of the bag. Uh, you know, they got the liquor barn thing oh. on there, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. I think it's... Um, sorry, go ahead. I think it's worth I'm kind up. of... I wish uh, Perry swayed me a little bit on the proof point. Yeah. Because he, he was talking about how it was hot, and I was like, I think it's like... I was I was expecting... Like an, I, w- I about said 90, but then that was so far off of 100 to you, 110. I was like, you know what, though? I like, need to like, get lower. That, that is, this is a classic case of what we've been talking about for a long time of how lower proof usually seems to introduce more heat or seems to introduce mm-hmm. more alcohol burn. And I, I don't know the science behind it. I don't know uh, what kind of introduces that into the flavor profile, but... The, I, it, you know, what's funny, like as soon as I said that and I started thinking about it, I was like, that's there is no way that it is that high proof because the palate is so gentle. Right. Yeah. And it was really just the heat that I was getting on the nose or the alcohol burn that I was getting on the nose. It wasn't until like I had a couple more sips. I should have taken a little bit more time with it. But that was a really good that was a really good uh, flapping your wings without your spectacles on Swan. So the next section that we usually do um, is what you've been drinking recently or this week, recent ingestion of distillation. (laughs) Kurt, do you want to talk about what distillate you've you've ingested first? Uh, (laughs) It sounds terrible. Um. (laughs) It's... (laughs) This is the roughest one. I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> I believe it's it. not. It's not good. I believe it. <laughs> I believe it. I, or maybe I, it I, isn't. Um. So I have been drinking. I went and picked up a Knob Creek Rye. Oh, okay. Like a a pick of it, or is it just like the regular standard release? Uh, it's just the standard. Uh, you know, Knob Creek Rye, and it's pretty good. I I've been trying to push myself more towards rye, so I like. If we're being honest, I prior to that, I've had probably like three or four bottles like that I bought personally mm-hmm. of just rye whiskey. Um, so I was like, yeah, let's do it. So yeah, it's been pretty good, mm-hmm. and and it's taken me a bit, but I've finally got used to that spice, that fresh kind of spice um, that you get with rye. You're kind of getting into over, it in over a the years. Weird time. I've always been like I always get in a rye kick towards like. October, November, and they just ride that out all winter. But you're getting mm. into well, you're getting into or summer now, and you're you're kind of getting into it. Yeah, I think it's probably just the amount of time I have on my hands. Yeah, so. that's true. Yeah, you were talking about Animal Crossing being a potential nine to five. I can imagine rye whiskey kind of popping into your head is like, Let's just do something different. Yeah, yeah. I feel like <laughs> this has been a time for me to be like, ah, oh, well, I've always done this. Let's try. <laughs> Try this. Been changing a, you know, changing it up a little bit. Yeah. What about you, Perry? Oh my gosh, I have been drinking a multitude of things. Um, first off, because <laughs> I am now working for unemployment, which is no secret to the show or the listeners of the show. Um, happy hour starts at basically whenever I feel like at this point, um, depending on the roughness or the day or the week or the hour. So I just kind of get stuck into whatever's laying around. I had some uh, <clears throat> listener, excuse me, bottles sent in. Um, he and McMaster sent me a couple bottles of Antique 107 nice. uh, with with the cork, too, which is very nice. Uh, Troy from Speakeasy, Wisconsin, I don't have the bottle handy, uh, sent me their newest uh, Knob Creek pick as well. Um, it was a nine-year pick, 
I believe, uh, that was released in support of one of their group members, uh, father passing away from cancer. Um, and if you were lucky enough to get a, uh, get a bottle of that, some of the excess cost, uh, went to cancer research. And so I made sure to donate a little bit extra, um, to that bottle and, and to research, um, after I got that, um, as a recording yesterday was Derby day. Uh, and traditionally, of course you drink mint juleps. I made a brown sugar mint, simple syrup, um, which turned out fantastic. Um, I really enjoyed that. And then also soon whenever, whenever we can get around to it, uh, heaven Hill sent us a couple of new bottles to review. Uh, first was the, these. The Larceny Barrel Proof uh, B520 at 122.2 proof. And then the Elijah Craig B520 Ooh. at uh, 127.2 proof. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting back to drinking that with you guys. Yeah, no, I'm excited. Yeah, I want to bring over also, my release that's 127 for Elijah Craig Barrel Proof for you to try it alongside it. I want to see how different they are being off 0. 0.2. As far as what I've been drinking recently, Rare Breed. I picked up a new bottle of it, and I've just been going through it, man. Rare Breed, Knob Creek Picks, just classic. You can't go wrong Amen. with it at all. I'm into that. I need something else to drink. Yeah, um... Kurt, I think I'm going to stick with some Rebel Yell 10. I dropped you off some of it, and I'm going to drink some, too. Hey, I'll keep it going with you. I'll go for a, I'll go for a weeder. Okay. It's much... Which one? <laughs> it's quite different, but it's Old Fitz Prime. The oh, 80s, is it the 86? It's the 86 proof instead of the 80 proof, which is uh, what, what's out now. So I actually like it um, quite a bit more than the, the 86 or the 80 proof that's out at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's so easy to overlook that 80 proof bottle because it just looks like some cheesy gold foil stuff thrown up on there. But, uh, you want to talk about cheesy gold foil though? Cheesy gold foil turkey? The original cheesy gold foil. (laughs) One of the best bourbons I've ever had in my entire life. Well, for the best transition in bourbon podcasting history, we're going to move over to the news section. (laughs) Uh, stuff I saw on Instagram this week is what I'm calling this one. (laughs) Uh, Perry, I'm going to throw the new segment over to you so we can go over some of these new releases. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So um, this has been kind of a um, kind of a tough week for some of the uh, some of the craft producers in the industry. Um, If you look at what's been going on in Lexington, Kentucky, which is where we all three are at the moment, there has been a huge uh, downtick in terms of uh, craft breweries and distilleries and the way that they have unfortunately been affected by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, there was a, a news release that came out this week from uh, the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States uh, that shows uh, under a new survey that COVID-19 has created uh, severe financial hardships for craft distilleries and um just a, a few little bullet points for this. Uh, the survey includes 118 distilleries across 35 states and D.C. The survey's top findings, <clears throat> approximately 43% of distillery employees have been let go or furloughed since the start of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, the average distillery uh, respondent had almost 14 employees uh, before the COVID-19 crisis and has let go nearly six employees. Um, on average, distilleries reported a 64% sales decline. Uh, two thirds of respondents do not believe that they will be able to, this is the one that gets me. Um, (laughs) two thirds of respondents do not believe that they will be able to sustain their business, uh, for more than six months. 42% 42% of distillers do not anticipate being able to sustain their business for more than three months. 21% of distillers do not anticipate being able to sustain their business for more than three to six months. Uh, 63% of respondents reported canceling purchases of agricultural products or other inputs such as stills, bottles, and barrels. Um, the, look, we know so many people through this show 
who work for craft distilleries. Um, and I think that there are going to be those who come out on top. I think they're going to be okay. Maybe not necessarily on top, but they're going to have, um, a little bit more, it's going to be easier for them to get back into it. That's what I'm going to say. They're going to be able to stay above right, water. But they're, when, when you think about the craft distilleries we have talked to at Bourbon on the Banks, Bourbon and Beyond, um, I, I, festivals like that, it just absolutely breaks my heart to know that there is some of these people who will not be able to continue making something that they love or create yeah. because of all this out of, because of something that is so wildly out of their control at this point. And it, I think the part of this that really gets me is I know that just because we're a three tier system that, you know, distributors may just not be buying their stuff right now. And they're doing it with a grocery, even like Lay's potato chips. They're like, well, we're going to put out our flagship stuff and all the crazy weird things that we have been doing, like the, you know, strange flavored chips. We're just going to stop producing that for right now because I'd rather put the main products on the shelf just so there's stuff there. Um, and I think the distributors are having to do the same thing. I mean, if I've got to choose between buying six cases of wild turkey to send to a store or buying up five craft distillers, I'd rather send the stuff I, I know 100% everyone's going to buy. Um, I mean, I've seen less variety in stores recently just because of it. And they make so much money off of like being a wedding venue and having people do the tourism stuff. Then all that's closed down right now. I mean, their, their revenue streams are just strained. It, yeah. Yeah. It's super, super sad to hear. And, and what really stands out to me is the, uh, 42% of distillers says they won't, do not anticipate being able to sustain their businesses for more than three months. Yeah. I mean, three months and that's almost half. Um, and, and you know, that's just really, really tough to hear because, you know, some of these great, uh, you know, new craft kind of stuff that would be coming up in the times and that we would be trying would, um, and tasting. Yeah. You know, that something, some stuff that we could, be like wow this is amazing stuff um so that's really unfortunate and all because you know something that you can't control like like perry was saying uh and then you i, I don't want to like get too deep in, into it is but you, you go even further and they're not buying uh you know corn from the farmers or they're not buying you know stuff that would be included mm -hmm. to go that so it affects that too um, so yeah, it, it's definitely hard to hear. Yeah. And not everyone's got to set up quite like Jeff the Creed or somebody where they grow a lot of stuff on site and they produce their own things and, and they're kind of relying on picking up product from other places. And if they stop purchasing, I mean, that's, it's going to hurt. Yeah. I mean, that's just hurting the whole system from the bottom up. So, mm -hmm. well, I, I guess, you know, some of the, like silver lining kind of just looking at the positives on, on some of this is that the bourbon industry is a boom, booming bourbon, like a booming industry. And uh, right now, and you know, even with that, you know, some of that stuff happening, you'll start seeing more kind of pick up, I think afterwards as well and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it'll be good. I, I do expect them to come up with some unique ideas when they come back just to kind of create revenue, even if it's like an ultra behind the scenes tour or if it's more of a like in-depth tasting or something just to charge a little extra. And, you know, I'm willing to pay it because I know right now that they're hurting. So if I've got to pay, yeah, if I got to pay to go see Buffalo Traces tour again that I've done five, six times, I'm willing to do it. I mean, it's a donation at that point, you know, just helping them out. Yeah. There, there is during this time something to be said about uh, buying local, right? And I mean that doesn't just mean local big name distilleries, but it does mean the local craft distilleries who need that support. You know, it, it's just 
it's unfortunate and just so dang sad really and we we wanted to get um that that part of it out of the way because it's it's tough to talk about the people that we know through the show and the people that we have become friends with through the show suffering so much because of this and yeah people are are going to you know bounce back in different ways i i fully expect you know the these these minds who have crafted great products and and great distillate to eventually you know when the time is right create something new or revive what they originally created um but in the meantime it ain't easy man it's definitely not yeah it's making me want to go buy some uh james e pepper to support local um i look it's gonna be tough for me to pass up new riff and wilderness trail and bluegrass distillers over the next couple of months yeah absolutely Okay, we, like I said, we wanted to get that out of the way. I apologize for a little yeah. bit of a, um, a downturn. Yesterday, though, as of recording, I uh, did see a very successful um, virtual whiskey event, what they were uh, claiming to be uh, the first virtual whiskey conference, um, basically ever. The the Whiskey From Home uh, uh, conference which was put on by Bourbon Pursuit, sponsored by um, Rabbit Hole, <clears throat> and featured just a whole host of folks that are friends with the show and just just people who are so well engrossed in the the whiskey world. Uh, bourbon Pursuit, Bourbon or Breaking Bourbon, Dad's Drinking Bourbon. Uh, Bourbon of Banter, Fred Menick, It's Bourbon Night, Peggy No Stevens, Rare Bird 101, Sipping Corn, Suburbia, uh, Take Dot Review, The Bourbon Enthusiast, uh, and The Bourbon Review. I, that, that was a stellar lineup uh, of folks who were basically giving free talks uh, online for five and a half hours uh, on Saturday afternoon. And it was... <laughs> in many ways, just kind of an information dump, but it was presented by people who knew what they were talking about and they did it well. Um, there, there were, you know, I, I of course kind of popped in and out of some of these, these streams. Um, I made sure to stick around for Chad and Sarah, of course it's bourbon night. And then for Fred's, uh, tasting panel as or excuse me, his tasting guide, uh, as well. Um, I, I love, this I love this so much. Um, having done not exactly the same thing by any means with the the day of live streams back at the what middle beginning of March. Mm-hmm. I mean that was, you know that <clears throat> that was kind of what I felt like was our own take on it. Um, but it still was really cool to see the community come together. In both of these ways. So I, I think this is, th- there are, there are so many different things that are happening during this time creatively that are allowing people to realize that they can do basically whatever they want to from, mm-hmm. from home. And there's no better time to experiment with new fields and with new platforms than the time we're in right now. And I think that Whiskey From Home, they did they did a solid, solid job of it. And I, my hat is definitely off to Bourbon Pursuit and Kenny and Ryan and uh, Fred as well uh, for making something really so large scale happen. And I think they did it pretty well. Yeah, no, they definitely did. I, they did it right in the wake of uh, all that being canceled as well. So it was it was nice for them to have an outlet for that. Yeah, 
definitely. That was that was all that we really wanted to say about that. It was just kind of a shout out and kudos to uh, to those guys for putting on a very very successful event. Um, some releases that uh, were dropped over on Whiskey Advocate. Uh, the first one, <clears throat> I don't know anything about this. Uh, it seems like these first three actually are just kind of new brands that are coming out. Yeah. Um, it's all from, <coughs> excuse me, the Clover. Um, it is MGP whiskey um, in some regards. Uh, the first one is a four-year-old single barrel straight bourbon at uh, 92 proof and $50. Uh, spring 2020 is the release 24,000 bottles made at MGP aged for four years. Another MGP four year old whiskey. Yay. Yeah. It's hard to get excited about it. Um, I don't know. I mean, the bottle's cool. I mean, the branding's not really going to stick out on the shelf, but individually it looks fine. I just, I don't know. I'm not super excited about it. The Tennessee one that they've got, this is the next one here. It's a... Damn it, Swan. Yeah, it's a 10-year-old... <laughs> that was going to be my point. <laughs> yeah, a 10-year-old Tennessee whiskey. I think it's weird. I mean, I would have much rather have seen a 10-year-old uh, just straight bourbon whiskey. Because I, I guess this Tennessee straight bourbon whiskey, they've done the Lincoln County process. Is that mm-hmm. the is that the deal, or is it just sourced from Dickel? Um, I'm not seeing... I'm not seeing anything that says where it was sourced. Uh, well, actually, I take that back. Um, the origin does say Tennessee. So, I mean, there's a chance that it's that it's Dickel. Um, oh, it says right here, through the label reads, Tennessee straight bourbon whiskey. This whiskey underwent the Lincoln County process. So, I mean, it's it's got those... Checkmate, Jack Daniels deniers. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, it's that that is just odd to me. Like, I mean, everyone's clamoring right now for more and more, you know, age stated above six, seven years, you know, bourbon whiskeys and come out with the Tennessee one, which it could be fine. You know, it could be fine. It's just it's a lot of purists that are not going to be happy with that one. So this actually reminds me of yeah. something that was sent through to me um, by a listener of the show, John Spaulding. Um, he said, while, uh, well, he, he sent a, a couple of different facts actually, um, that pertain to last week's episode. So I'm actually going to read that if that's okay. Um, yeah, which leads into this thing about the Lincoln County whiskey, uh, or Lincoln County process rather. Um, there is another distillery making a double cast weeded bourbon, St. Augustine distillery in Florida. Um, has one, and he said it's probably the worst bourbon I've made the mistake of buying. <laughs> All right, bold. So maybe we could throw that into the flight that's going to happen eventually. I don't know if we want to. I'd like to try it at the very least. Uh, second, there is a there is a distillery that ages bourbon and rebarrels it at a lower proof. Pritchard's Distillery in Tennessee has a bourbon, uh, probably sourced from Heaven Hill, that they do this with. Uh, and then his final comment, getting back to uh, the, the Lincoln County process. Uh, while I'm sharing odd facts, uh, Pritchard's is located in Lincoln County, Tennessee, but they're the only distillery allowed to produce and sell Tennessee whiskey without using the Lincoln County process. They're also that one that has that weird Pritchard's double chocolate. Oh, that's right. And still get to call it bourbon. So they've got a lot of weird exceptions there at Pritchard. I remember when you sent that through. I totally forgot about yeah. that, Swan. Thank you for bringing that back up. So they, they've got some weird exceptions. I'm wondering how the TTB lets them do that. Yeah. What kind of dirt do they get on the TTB, man? I need to know. <laughs> uh, the difference here, though, is that it's a 10-year-old uh, is straight whiskey, 70 bucks a bottle, 12,000 bottles. Um, and the last one that they listed was the, uh, Clover, well, not the, not the last one, but the last one from the, uh, the Clover products. That's Clover four-year-old single barrel straight rye. It's another MGP rye, uh, 91 proof, four years old, of course, 50 bucks a bottle, uh, spring 2020, 24,000 bottles. Um, look, 
depending on the mash bill, I'm fairly excited for this. Yeah, I think this last one I'm I'm most excited for because four years is starting to get some decent age for a straight rye. I, I would like to know what the mash bill on it is though, because I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it on on the bottle anywhere or listed in the description here. No. We'll have to dig into it a little bit more and maybe talk about it in the future. Why do you think? They went with a 10-year Tennessee. I know we talked about, like, we we questioned why, but what do you think would be a reason? Maybe they saw a gap in the market. Tennessee, whiskey, uh, Dickel's about the only ones that does an age statement. That's usually on their picks. I can't think yeah. of much else. So maybe, and I guess, obviously, this release was going to be happening before pandemic or stuff like well, that. So. <clears throat> Maybe they were trying to break into a different thing. Maybe, but if we look at what it, you know, what is legally allowed under Tennessee whiskey, right? What we were just talking about with how Pritchard is only the only distillery that can call itself Tennessee whiskey without going through the process. I mean, it could just be that by default they went and they said, we're making a Tennessee whiskey and somebody said, well, you've got to put it through the Lincoln County process. It's true. I mean, yeah. it, it, it could just, I, I don't even know if it's something that they set out to do. It could have just been a default based on, you know, due process. Where they wanted. Yeah. I also like that Whiskey Advocate took a bold stance on this. They put, yes, Tennessee whiskey is bourbon, and they linked it. To something else, they they are really sure on that one. That's some controversial <laughs> stuff right there. Yeah, well, that's a conversation that's been going around and around for ever at this point. <laughs> yeah. So uh, next one we've got is a Sagamore Spirit Brewer Select Ale Barrel Finished Rye. Man, that is a mouthful. Uh, so. It, it looks like it's another expansion on the Sagamore Spirit line that they've got, and they've got quite a few. I think they do like a cognac finish was one of the newer ones, a double-barreled, um, just a few, a few other things they've got. I think the interesting thing about this one is is it's a 744 bottles. I don't remember them doing a very narrow release on a lot of their other stuff. It's generally pretty wide. Um so this one looks like it's actually going to be aged as far as the beer that it's aged in Sierra Nevada, which is a big craft brewing yes. company. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested to see what this one's like. I've not had too many uh, ale finish stuff other than uh, like the bluegrass distiller stuff that they've put out. Um, so I, I'm, I'm interested. I think it's a, a really, I like the quote at, from this on at the bottom it says uh, that it's close to our heart as many of their distillers were brewers in past lives and they were like a lot of their distillers are from new belgium brewery and flying dog brewery so uh i thought that was kind of cool i i have really only ever had one or two beer finished whiskeys and I can't remember off the top of my head the names of either of them. Um, we got to try the bluegrass distillers finished in, in like the apple ale, I think, which is not quite. That's, yeah, that was at Bourbon on the Banks, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. And then we've also had the Goodwood finished stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, but the or wait, are you talking about the Bardstown Bourbon Company stuff? I've not had that. Well, there's the Bardstown Bourbon Company stuff, which I, I've not had, but the actual Goodwood itself releases they did that they age it in stout barrels. Right. If you're just talking right, but that's beer finished. But that's not whiskey finished in beer barrels. You see what I'm saying? True. Like I've had yeah. plenty of okay. stouts or, or, or beers finished in whiskey barrels, but like the other way around, I've not had many of. With, you know, between yeah, oh. between the two um, that we've yeah. had, um, the Bluegrass Distillers one was phenomenal. And I, honestly, I cannot remember for the life of me the name of the other one. Um, so I, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of an untapped market in in terms of 
you know, the next step in finishing. Yeah. I know that I the one that I've had is not actually a bourbon or a rye. It's uh the I think it's the Caskmates um Jameson. I tried <laughs> that. I mean it's it's fine, you know. Um but I, I'm excited because I this is also a rye too, so this is not this is not a bourbon. Um yeah. So I'm I'm interested. And a lot of their stuff that they've put out has been good. Like I, I've not tried the cognac finish, but I've had their double barreled one that I think Chad and Sarah really mm-hmm. enjoyed and it was it was pretty good. It's good stuff. For sure. And then the uh, last release we got on here, um, before we get to the TTB filings is the Mictor's ten year old single barrel twenty twenty release. Always phenomenal. Um if I can get my hands on another bottle, I'm definitely bringing it home with me. I think last year's was the best one that I've had so far. And and, and that is really just within my limited range of experience with it. Um, I, I have had basically everything from 2017 to, well, okay, so three years of releases. Um, mm-hmm. And... 2017 I was a little disappointed with 2018 was a step up and then 2019 I thought was spectacular like I've had to if if I need to put a bear trap around my bottle of the Michter's 10 from 2019 I very well might um, because I do like it that much yeah and I, I think it comes in at a decent proof. I've always been a little underwhelmed by the proof, but it's it's so flavorful. It's hard to be mad at, you know. Um, I do like that all these others that we've listed. It's got availability down to the bottle count, even to seven hundred and forty-four. The last one, and this one just says limited edition. <laughs> they have no yeah. idea how many they're putting right. out. <laughs> I have a question for you guys too. Um, do you think this product would benefit more from? being a small batch release or do you think that there's something more interesting in it being single barrel um i don't quite know if they've got the stock for a small batch if they do i'd love to see it a small batch just to get more of it you know um i'm not mad at a single barrel but if i could find it on the shelf at the actual price that they've listed here i'm all for it all right so the next one we've got is a, a pinhook release. This is a new TTB filing. Uh, this one's interesting. They've they've been pretty consistently saying that they're putting out their own product, aged at Castle and Key, and this one's going the opposite direction. This one's a aged twelve years straight bourbon whiskey. Yeah, and how the, do you guys feel about that? I well, so I, I'm excited about this product itself. Um, but I think I'm a little bit more excited about what it's going towards. Um, so on the back of the label, uh, it says we at Pinhook owe our success to the restaurants and bars that pour Pinhook for their guests. Uh, now it's our turn to support them by donating all the profits from this special true single barrel bottling of one of Pinhook's original 20 barrels, uh, to the James Beard foundation food and beverage industry relief fund. Um, that's phenomenal. I mean, well, well done. By Pinhook. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, great thing to be doing. Good for them, man. That's that's a big step mm-hmm. up. <clears throat> the fact that it's from some of their original stock, <laughs> that is just so cool. Um, and and if, if you look at the back of the, the label, too, it is still being uh, bottled at Castle and Key. Uh, so clearly the partnership is still well and, and very truly alive with... with uh, castle and key despite them not sourcing from them for this release yeah and do you see the bottle number on this 289 <laughs> i like oh, yeah. the the actual yeah. bottle number that they used for this though <laughs> 69. that's good <laughs> that's good whoever whoever filed this to the ttv has a sense of humor well done <laughs> good on them uh it's also called bourbon courage i don't know if we mentioned that yeah, Bourbon Courage, and then they, they go into detail about the horse, because that's kind of their deal. <clears throat> I I yeah. imagine... It's a clever little thing. Yeah. We've talked about that, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. It's but just it's like, cool to have everything kind of lumped together with their releases, in that case. 
Yeah, yeah. and tie into Kentucky I imagine too. that we are never, ever going to see a bottle of this in one of our possessions. <laughs> no, and if I do, it's going to be on the top shelf for quadruple <laughs> the price. But, th- you know, that's fine. Hey, honestly, at that point, I'm more willing to pay it just knowing that it's going to... Uh, what is it here? The the James Beard Foundation mm-hmm. Food and Beverage mm-hmm. Industry Relief Fund. Yeah, I'm I'm all for it. I'd like to have this at a restaurant. I feel like, and somehow that's like honoring it a little more than if I, yeah. you know, pay above retail in a in a liquor store. But either way, I think it'd be fun to try. So that's about all the news for this week. Yeah, it was um, kind of a light news week. Yeah, it's not too much, but I've actually got. A double review plan for you I'm guys. So excited! You guys up for that? I can't oh wait. Boy, yeah. So what we're gonna do? Just to preface. What if this, I said no? Like then? I mean, absolutely. I don't know. You're gonna have to take it up with the stream yard bird. He looks pretty mad. <laughs> um, but we're gonna go ahead and do a nose palette finish on both of these, and then I'll reveal the price on both of them. Okay. And then we'll do kind of a comparative review. Um, because they they are similar in nature somehow. So I would like for you guys to kind of take that into consideration. I'm not going to tell you how, sure. though. What uh, do you guys want to start with, A or B? Let's go with, you know, alphabetical order. Let's go A. All right. I'm All down. Right. Sounds good. <sighs> hmm. Perry's giving me the side eye over here. I'm, I'm giving you the confused eye. Mm, okay. That's fair. That's fair. I mean, if we're going with what what the trend's been lately this is a blend of something <laughs> it's possible we would be able to accurately review that has it stopped you before perry not for a review oh for a review yeah, yeah like that's no, that's that's a flying blind deal man no no that's <laughs> a uh flapping my wings without spectacles deal ah yes uh, sorry yeah yeah yeah, I also had another one here just in case that one didn't land and we had to edit around it. I left my corrective eyewear in the nest, uh, <laughs> but I want to flap. That's a good one. <laughs> it's kind of minty. It is a little minty. Yeah, it's uh, following that mint julep trend a little. You know, I'm not getting a lot of like deeper notes on the nose. Like it's all very upfront, bright notes. Mm-hmm. Um, it yeah. it's too early for me to say that I feel like this might be a rye. Okay, but I feel if it's not a rye, I feel like it might be a high rye bourbon. But then again, I haven't even had a sip of it. I feel so. the same way. I just I just took had a had a sip of it, and I'm getting more of those kind of rye or high rye notes and see it gets so confusing with that because some of these like barely legal rye's are just skirting that line you know i it's i it might be skirting it's real i skirt it's just it's a confusing thing you guys got a guess on the proof on this one mm, not yet let me let me go in for another sip I, it has proved me wrong before, but based on the nose and the palate, it feels like it's a rye whiskey. Okay. It doesn't feel, feel, go ahead. Sorry. I I understand that. I will say this one is a pick. (laughs) I have no idea what's going on then. Cool. (laughs) It is very reminiscent of the standard release. We'll give you that. It's a pick, but it's reminiscent. Proof rise? I'm going with a... A 90 to 90... No. I think I want to go like a... Like an... I want to say like an 88 to a 94 or a 90 to 96. Okay. That's fair. It's pretty See, close. I, I think that the I feel like the the mouthfeel and the depth of flavor kind of leads to it being maybe a little bit less watered down. I don't know if it's in the nineties. 
I'm gonna say what? I'm gonna say one ten. Okay. So how how are you guys feeling about the nose? How would you rate that? I, I'm gonna give personally, if I had to give it, I'm gonna give it a three. It's it's very middle of the road. Um, I'm gonna go two point five. It's not it's not really up there for I, me. I was gonna say I'm going two point five on this one. Like it's it it's not deep. It's it's interesting, yeah. but it's not interesting in the way that like I'm kind of bouncing off the walls about it. It's a little too bright. It's a little too yeah. much of that mint and bright notes that you're you get. Mm-hmm. I just want a little a little something deeper with that. Like, am I getting more spice? Am I getting more of that traditional uh, nose with that? And I think that's where I'm missing it a little bit. So yeah, I, I'm sticking with the two. Point five as well. Yeah, for me, it definitely like nose wise feels beginner whiskey ish. Yeah. So, mm. what, what do you think about the palate, Kurt? I think the palate uh, is kind of where that kind of gets opens up and is is a lot better, uh, where you have more of a spice. And we're talking like it's already a a rye whiskey, <laughs> like we know for sure. Um, which we'll see if that comes back to get us. Oh yeah. Um <laughs> but I think that's where it it kind of sh- starts to shine a little more and I, so for that I'm going to give it uh I'm going to give it a 3. I I mean I'm not blown away by any means. It's middle of the road. I think it's good. Uh I think it's the best part of this in my opinion. Uh so a 3. Yeah, I I I don't know if it's the best part of it, but I do think that it's definitely a step up from the nose. I don't I am having such a hard time nailing down what this is. Yeah. Palette wise, I think it's probably the strongest point of the bourbon. I agree with you, but it's still just a three. I mean it's just it's middle of the road. I do think this is a good beginner bourbon. It, like it's got just a little bit past depth. You start getting to, a little into that, like So it is a bourbon. It's a bourbon. Yeah, it's it's a bourbon. Uh, but it's it's it gets a little in that tobacco range, but it's it kind of missing some sweetness or something. Like it's just it's not fully there for me. But this is a pick. This is a pick. Yeah. <sighs> Perry, I know you're gonna beat yourself up over this one. As I know what it is. I am really starting to regret the this the things that i've said so far finish what are you guys thinking i actually I two. Ooh, two oh really yeah i'm not a fan of the finish i like the finish quite a bit personally oh, okay um I'm, I'm starting to i wow. uh, get into kind of this there's like a a s'mores flavor that i'm getting on the finish that is i i think is really really nice honestly um but it also complements the the kind of brighter notes that we were getting on the palate, the mint, um, the 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 citrus as well. I think that it's I think that it's really quite nice. I gave it a three point five. Okay, gotcha, Kurt. Uh, okay, I'm going with a uh, I'm two point seven five. Not as oh. good as the nose. Uh, not as good as the the palate, but not as good as the nose. Sure. Um, it has a really nice mouth feel and like as it it kind of drips as you uh, as you yeah, swallow it and uh, so I like the finish as far as that goes. I really like the coating and how oily it is, but uh, it kind of ends short for me. Yeah, I get that. And, the, and it's just not. It doesn't give me. I don't know. It's something I I don't want to go back for it. Yeah, that's that's why I kind of rated it so low. Is I just like I, I don't reach for this one at all. Uh, and, and the finish doesn't really do much for me. It just kind of it's flat, you know. Um, so the the price on this for a seven fifty is sixty dollars at retail. Whoa, yeah. So uh, that being in mind, I I'm gonna give it a two point five. Uh. I have a hard time saying anything other than that as well. Yeah. 2.5. This better not be a Russell single barrel. 
<laughs> no, no. I didn't specifically pick a bad pick of Russell's. No, no, no. I would I would definitely it'd be higher caliber than this. But uh this is gonna be a comparative review, so if we do need to switch it around, we can, but final score for me is gonna put me right at ten. So it's not I, uh not fair and great. Yeah, I gave it an eleven point five. Ten point seven five. You and that point seven five man, I love that. You and Chad. <laughs> so just to keep it simple, if you want to up the score instead of going back, specifically saying which one, we can just do like add a point, subtract a point. But I'm gonna move on to B. Yeah, I'm excited about okay. it. Yeah, this okay. note is where. All right. <laughs> that is much more like I feel in my wheelhouse in my home. Yeah. See, the thing is, like, I, I feel like I know what oh, is yeah. in your collection, Swan, to a degree. But at the same time, I could be completely thrown off. I've not been posting for months, man. I've just been taking my time, doing my own thing. You haven't so even you really been what's telling us what you've been picking up. Yeah, yeah. Was you, this the long con? Wild card. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, it's the long con. I think this nose has a lot more to offer. Like that brown sugar that you were pointing out that you made that that brown sugar like syrup. It it kind of oh. feels like it's got that in there, you know. Uh, oh, there's like so, there's like apple peel in there too. Yeah. See, I'm getting your s'more note. I, I am this. too on the nose, which actually is kind of encouraging for me based on what we could get into with the with the palate. Because it seemed like on the last one, the, the the s'mores note on the finish was almost an afterthought, right? Where mm-hmm. I feel like this might be a little bit more prominent in that regard. Yeah. I just took a sip. <laughs> it's just... Whew. Ooh, as in... Hot, it's uh it's a little hot Ooh, but it's it's good you know like the stuff that we were kind of iffy on in the nose is definitely prominent in the palate that is chewy yeah that is, is a dense chewy mouthfeel oh this one is not a pick this is the standard release really really yeah. This is good. Yeah. I enjoy it. So what are you guys feeling for, for nose on this one compared to you can compare it to the last one or you can just rate it as is. I feel like we should rate it as is and then we'll come back around and kind of compare. OK, it. yeah, I get that. I kind of feel that way just because, you know, don't want to influence it'll score. sway us a little bit on. Yeah. And then later on, we can be like, oh, OK, this is where. Part of me almost wishes that I had nosed these side by side Mm -hmm. because the nose on A has changed significantly now that I've gotten into the nose on B. Yeah, they're totally different bourbons. It's it's wild. But the same. What have you done to us, Swan? One is just watered down. (laughs) One is the only single barrel of Stag Jr. ever. <laughs> yeah. And the other is piss water. <laughs> yeah. I robbed Harlan Wheatley. It's all good. Yeah. Dude, like, even going back to A, oh, there's a note of, like, which is so weird, but it smells like a log cabin. In Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Oh, really? Oh, I get that. Yeah, like that weird, like cypressy. Yeah, just, like, but there's still kind of like, like fresh air, tiny mountain trees around you too. Yeah. Oh, that's I. I, I the that. the nose has improved on A as I've gone to B. What is happening? What What have you done? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be honest, I was so I was so confused on what to do that I, I brought in help. So Adam Terry, 
helped me pick some of these. Yeah. I, that's a face right there, Perry. Did he now? <laughs> he, he did. Oh. Perry's like, I know. Yeah. Yeah. So did you give a, a palette? I haven't even given a nose on, on B yet. I've been I've been yeah, so yeah, I've been sorry, going back and forth so much that I've I've had to like reconsider what I'm doing. Yeah. Also check out Swan's gallon yeah, jug dude, of water. You, right you about now. to go do uh, your two a days for football? Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, bro. No, it's just so cheap. Bro, how many squats can you do? I mean like when you're at <laughs> two? We can do two. At this point. Uh, <laughs> At this point, yes. No, it's just if you're at work, it's like fifty cents for a little bottle of water, or like seventy cents for a giant gallon. All right, I think it's time for the nose. I'm gonna I'm gonna give this one a three point five. Yeah, I feel like it's got more to offer than the previous one. Just scoring it on its own, it's just so much darker. You know, like it's it's got it's got a lot of like chewiness just even in the nose which is strange because i don't choose my nose very often uh but it, it's different i do i do like the darker notes it does have kind of like a s'moresy note on the nose as well can i just yeah. say if i i if, gave it if, a three if adam terry feels offended by what i've said on the first mm-hmm. one i apologize no it's all good <laughs> It's all good. I think he'll be fine. I hope. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Um, I gave the nose a three point two five on B. Okay. Um, I think it's a significant step up. I think it's much more well rounded, uh, but at the same time, invites more insight into the depth of the the overall nose. Gotcha. Palette wise, though, I gave it a three point five. Okay. I think it's yummy. It's real. It's real mm, nice. I, I gave it a three point five two, and it kind of has that chewy. I mean, this is where yeah. it gets real chewy, and uh, and we were talking about that a little bit on. Well, I I was talking about it on the finish of the last one, and that's one thing I really right. really liked about it. Uh, so I gave it a three point five two, and it opens up into. Uh, you know, more of that s'mores, more of that uh, camp like fire feel. Yeah, I, I do like that. It's almost uh, a little scotchy in the smokiness that it, it has, which is, is odd, but it's not overwhelming. Like the sc- I don't know. I always get the smokiness on scotch after the fact. This is very upfront yeah. with the smokiness. It's very strange. Like as it's going down, I get the smokiness. Sure. Um, with that, I, I think the finish on this one is also better, personally. Um, I think it's 3.5, just all the way through for me. Nose palette finish. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's it's very consistent. That's one thing that I, I think is odd about this, is it doesn't have a ton of ups and downs. It's very consistent across the board, at least for me. Uh, so I, I've got 3.5 nose palette finish. I mean, I gave the finish a 3.75, but honestly, you know, when, when you look at the scores that I gave on this one, 3.25, uh, 3.5, 3.75, at that point, it's kind of like splitting hairs um, and getting yeah. into the, the nitty gritty of it. But... I, I mean, I think there is a clear progression in this bourbon. Um, I'm assuming it's a bourbon. It is. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Um, I'm assuming. Yeah. I, but I, I, we would be questioning our entire lives if we I'm, I'm just, got that one. I don't care anymore. Who's to say, dude? Um, but I feel like there is a clear progression from A to B to C uh, in this one. The, the finish is... Even still, I feel like I'm finding new notes. It's expanding. There's like a uh, like a frosted Cheerios note too that I'm even picking up now. That's making yeah. me want to like go back for another sip. I mean, they, not that um, sample A didn't have that because it did. There were there were interesting notes about it, but sample B just really seemed to elevate itself 
I, in, in this case, um, I mean, if I'm, if I'm going to crown a winner just based off of my, oh wait, I can't do that. What's the, what's the price one? <laughs> this one MSRP is 50. Wait, I haven't said mine. Oh wait, no, sorry. It's, sorry. Kurt. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah. So my finish, I, I gave it a 3.5, uh, for the same reasons. It, it really has a progression. It, it, it amps it up and, and kind of has about the same feel. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think it's really good. I like it. <laughs> and I think it's hard. It's very hard to, um, compare these two necessarily because with the pick and the standard offering, you know, it depends on who's picking it and what, how's it going? Um, you know, on, on, do you want to be a little different on your, on your pick? Do you want it to be the same? Uh, type of deal so it's hard to compare they're they're different in terms of yeah. you know of, of taste yeah they're no they're definitely completely different bourbons so the the msrp on this is 50 dollars uh so it is it is less than the first one i think overall it's a better bang for your buck yeah, honestly, I gave it a three point five. Okay, yeah, no, I, I gave it three point five across the board. <laughs> I gave it a three, so I'm at fourteen versus ten. I like the second one much better. I am also at fourteen. Yeah, I'm at thirteen. All right, so are you guys, you guys, good where you're at? You want to move anything around? Okay, are. Should we compare now? Yeah. What do you, what do you guys okay. feel comparison wise? Do you want to know what they are? Look, having having gone from B to A, mm-hmm. I think I'm going to stand by my initial statement or my initial feelings that B is better in general. Um, I will say though that I I might bump the final score up a point or two on A. I honestly don't I. I I feel like I know what this is at this point. Um, but to be very honest with you, um, there is nothing wrong with, with a, I think it is still very serviceable and very enjoyable. I just prefer B, um, over the two. So Swan, go ahead and show me. All right. What's... So a is, so here's the fun thing. It's actually the same. Wait a second. Go ahead. I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna jump mine to a to an eleven point five. Okay. So the from my ten point seven five. That's fair. Get rid of that point seven five. That's fine. So this is actually the same mash bill as our flying blind. So today's samples were Blanton's and Rock Hill. A oh. would be Blanton's, and B is Rock Hill. Really? Yeah. Was A wait, 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 wait. was A the the um Blanton's Derby pick 2018? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So we had the same for everything today. They're all the same bourbon. So I Dude. made a joke that we proofed it down. We really did. It's the same thing proofed down. I have been saying for so long that I did not prefer Rock Hill over Blanton's. Yeah. And these okay. have been open All for right. about the same amount of time, too. So they've actually had the same time to kind of aerate and pick up some flavor and do their thing. Folks, this is why you do blind tastings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So that. So the same mash bill through all three different samples. Yeah. So here, I'll put it. I'll put it down here so you guys can see everything at once. But no, we did. uh we did all three, and we actually just killed the bottle of Blanton's. That was the last of it. Oh. But, yeah, we've got all three here. we got the Hancock's, Blanton's, and then the Rock Hill as well. So 88.9 on mm-hmm. the Hancock's, 93 on the Blanton's, and 100 on the Rock Hill. Yep. It's the extra proof, you think, it's, right? I, and, and it being a single, uh, uh, being a pick. I don't yeah, know so, if it's the fact that it's a pick. I just, I think that it really might be the proof. I mean, I, I, 
All right, shoot, dadgummit, now I've got to pour the rest of the Hancock so I can compare the the three. Yeah, so I will say this this pick of Blanton's is very reminiscent of just regular Blanton's. It's got a little bit more of a smoky flavor compared to a lot of the Blanton's that I've had, but they're all single barrels anyway, so at that point, it's just kind of a crapshoot. I just broke Perry. This is the best. I, I So this is something I've been wanting do. to do for a long time, and I've just not gotten to do it yet and like i i kind of wish that we had been able to even throw in like ancient age 90 yeah so that was one of the things that adam had recommended was a like an ancient age of some sort i think he said the 10 star if i had it which i don't but it would have been nice to throw in as well so there there was a moment in there that i was totally convinced that it was a new riff pick Mm -hmm. um that adam had orchestrated because the the price differences are very similar like yeah. the the new riff single barrel, uh, not pick wise, is fifty bucks, and the the picks themselves are, if not exactly close to sixty. So <laughs> I felt like I was about to offend Adam <laughs> <No>. <laughs> really quickly, no. but at the same time, I mean, it tasted older than new riff, so I was kind of battling back and forth with, you know, what I was feeling, but at the same time, dude. dude Having all three of these side by side, the fact that they're the same mash bill, but at completely different proofs. It's wild. It is baffling to me. Yeah, it is. It is a testament to how different an expression is. Like when they slap that different label and put it in a different bottle, it is a completely different bourbon. Because I know Heaven Hill gets a lot of crap for same mash bill and then like tons of different releases across their bottom and bond line but i mean obviously they stand out on their own same with buffalo trace perry needs like four well, other arms but i'm, I'm <laughs> trying to like i'm, I'm going like a b testing be- between them and what's funny is that the hancock's nose is very similar to the rock hill nose mm-hmm. the blanton's is definitely the outlier between the three yeah. But there's a little bit more brightness in the the Hancocks that honestly I'm not minding at this one. I think it's really kind of inviting. It is, yeah. I will say the lower proof that this gets, the more nuance I tend to get in the nose. Some of it I may not like the flavors I'm that I'm picking up, but it is more nuanced. I do get more the further I go down in proof, which is weird. But I also get almost as much ethanol on the uh, on the Hancocks as I do the Rock mm-hmm. Hill, which is wild because that's you know almost twelve points or eleven points difference. So going going A B with them, um, I think that the nose on the Hancocks is superior, but I mm-hmm. think that the proof on the Rock Hill makes the palette a standout between the two. Yeah. I, I mean, totally agree. honestly, yeah. I think that the, the rock Hill is so deep and flavorful. Um, and, and it, it, the, the, the Hancock's is right behind it, but the yeah. Blanton's is like a, it's like a distant third. Yeah. Unfortunately, no, I mean that that's what I'm saying. Sixty bucks at the distillery for a seven fifty of this. People go nuts. I mean, at this yeah. point, you you line up and they actually scan your ID and basically put you on a wait list for three months before you can even buy a new one. Right. From the distillery. I mean, I d I just don't think it's worth it. Granted, none of these are easy to find. Oh no. Oh no. At all. But it's you know, if you if you had to choose between these, I think Rock Hill is a great one to grab. I will be very honest with you. If if I had to search for a bottle of any of these three at this point, it would definitely be Rock Hill. I, yeah. I and I'm, I'm not saying that I'm going to go like fighting for it on secondary or anything, but it, it, it if it pops up on my radar I'm going to be tuned into it and I'm going to really, really try to make something happen. But first off, thanks, Juan. This was a really cool and interesting, different flight. But I, man. Yeah. 
All right, so that's going to wrap up our review. I'm glad I could trick you guys with some interesting pours. He definitely tricked me. I, I yeah. was pleasantly surprised by that. So I'm all same Asheville. Just it's ridiculous to think even knowing what it was. But uh, the next section that we got is our questions. So every week we post in our Facebook group and just kind of get some questions for the show. Uh, this week we got some <laughs> looks like we got some interesting ones here. Uh, first one's going to be from Bill. I'm sorry. Is it Robarge? I think so. OK, got you. All three of you walk into a bar. You're tasked with order or with the order of ordering the guy, the other two guys a drink that doesn't involve whiskey. So basically just whatever drink you could order one another. That's not whiskey. What are you ordering and what did they do to punish them so badly? So I, I'm guessing we have to punish each other with with whiskey or non whiskey pours. That's here. such a shame because like I wanted to, you know, order something that you would, you know, want to, I would want to order something that you would enjoy. Right. Like well, here, I would let's... order Kurt a margarita. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> he gave us the fist bump. Yeah. So Swan, a margarita. Swan. I don't know, dude. Like you, Honestly, you don't like. I just don't you, drink anything other than bourbon. I know. Like you don't. You don't like. Be- <laughs> Do you think you could make it through like a a barrel aged, like a bourbon barrel aged stout? I mean, I probably could. Yeah, I think I could get through it. Honestly, if you were picking a drink that I just absolutely hated, and you just looked at him and said, "Can I get like, can I get like a Jack Daniel's fire shot?" I think I'd lose it. I just couldn't do it. I might just walk out at that point. I mean, it's just anything, (laughs) anything, just cinnamon, overboard cinnamon, cannot, cannot do it. Yeah. Do you want to talk to about your undergrad years when? (laughs) No, no, absolutely not. Um, (laughs) uh, I don't know what I would. How about a, how about a, this is a classic that is not really that good, but like happened in college. A Jaeger bomb, uh, not a Jaeger bomb, but a uh, no, yeah, a Jaeger bomb. <laughs> Yikes, that was bad. Don, Don, Don Nishida in the chat Ooh. said, though, Kurt would order Mai Tais for Perry and Swan to remind them that he's been to Hawaii and they haven't. <laughs> That's brutal, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that That's is almost a worse. brutal response. That's almost worse than just being like, I'm gonna get them a crappy drink that they won't, they won't like. <laughs> Yeah, rubber faces in it. Yeah. For the record, you should go to. Hawaii. I want definitely to. should. <laughs> definitely should. It's not that I don't want to. I'm just. I'm working from home right now, yeah. trying to make sure that people get their unemployment checks. Anyway, Swan, what's the next question? This one is right up your guys' alley. This is inviting, inviting a good conversation. All that art class talk from last week. What bottle design or label do each of you think could use or could redesign and make it better? I mean, I took the very, very, um, what, what, what's the word? Strong approach to the wild turkey labels and thought that I did a better job at what they were making. And I mean, I don't dislike what I did by any means. Is it better than what they have out right now? Mm, I don't, I don't know. Maybe not necessarily. Um, uh, I'm going to really have to skirt around this question if that's okay. Yeah, it's all good. So, Kurt, what what bottle do you think you would task yourself with redesigning? It's it's weird. Let me let me say it's weird because I feel like the the distilleries or labels that have been redesigned recently have been done so successfully. Like even even with those that I feel are like cons- you got a lot to live up to. Well, yeah, like I, I feel like Elijah Craig did a great job of updating their label. But mm-hmm. on the flip side of that, like Evan Williams hasn't changed their label in a long time. And I feel like that's OK because they have a deep, consistent heritage. I feel like Elijah Craig was a name that was evoked by Heaven Hill to or introduced by Heaven Hill to evoke heritage right yeah. 
And by producing the label that they have, that is somewhere between classic and modern, it, it, it encourages people to drink that product regardless. I don't, I don't know. I, Kurt, what do you think? Uh, so I think one that I would really like to try, and it's not that it's bad. It's just like, I, I think that I've seen it so many times that I would like to try something different with it is, uh, Basil Hayden. I don't hate that. I don't hate that idea at all. It has that paper, uh, kind of that craft paper kind of, um, label to it Mm -hmm. and i'm not sure if it's really working for it Uh, after stocking a case of basil hayden and ripping about two or three of those i can tell you it is not working (laughs) for it yeah i i don't think it's very practical and and in design you definitely want things to be practical and and to work and you know even if something looks good which you know I, i i think it it looks fine i think that is a a problem is you know, if you're cracking and breaking the labels all the time, is that really effective design? Sure. Yeah. So I thought that one. Um, the other one I would like to take a stab at is uh, Bell Meads. Really? Really? I like Bell Meads. Do you feel like yeah. it's over designed? I think that the kind of shiny foil is what I don't like about it. So in our chat too, uh, Nick Zangatza said Kentucky spirit. <laughs> We've talked about this. Um, yes. They went from over, over designed to way under designed. They went from what I thought that was like pretty nice to y- you slapped a gold label on it and it didn't, I don't know, it doesn't strike you at all. I feel like Kentucky Spirit is probably the most overlooked wild turkey expression. I mean, it's just, it's, I I look at it on the shelf every time next to this bottle and think, yeah, now next time maybe. You yeah. know, I mean, it's just, I, I, I'm always going to grab right your brain. I'm really, I'm even looking at the the old bottle of Kentucky Spirit. Mm-hmm. It just was nice that it had its own bottle, even if it was the the uh, turkey, you know, feathers. I think that's still nice, and I I did hear that it broke, so that doesn't isn't really that cool. But I feel like with the gold label, it just doesn't it doesn't distinguish itself between anything else. Yeah, I feel that. I think if I had to pick one, I would probably go with uh, Henry McKenna Ten. Okay. I Let's just, hear it. I, Why? I I mean, it's just like it's beautifully ugly, I guess. But at the same time, I feel like with a redesign, it would be it'd be fine. I guess at this point, though, you probably want to pinpoint bourbons that aren't so iconic that it doesn't matter what they look like. Mm. Let me give a second. Uh, Wathens. I think Wathens could use a redesign because mm. it's a very yeah. like cardboardy looking label with a with a bottle that's been very overdone yeah. with Elmer T. Lee and some of the other releases that have used it. I think I think they could use a redesign because they're not bad. You know, they're just very tobacco forward and it doesn't draw a lot of people in. But if you bought a bottle of it, I think it'd, it'd be great. Also, I'm so tired of distilleries that do this thing where they put a giant number on the front of it and you're like, oh, eight year old. Great. I'm going to take it home. And then yes. you take home your Wathens and it says eighth generation distillery. Ooh. Agreed. I can't. I can't. It, it drives me nuts. The worst offender, Buffalo Trace. We just did an episode around Buffalo Trace, and I'm about to call them out for their for their uh, what is it? Old Charter, the the ten dollar release that they have, the bottom shelf one. It has a ginormous eight right on the front of it. And it just makes me mad. Yeah. Which leads me into the next question here. What's the worst bottom shelf bottle you're willing to admit you've purchased yourself? Not gifted, received for sample or review. Oh. It's that old charter. That that old charter eight, the eighty proof one that they put out. Awful. What's the uh the spring mill? 
whatever that yeah. comes in the ceramic bottle. Yeah. That is one of the nastiest things I've ever bought in my entire life. <laughs> I, I hate that to, bottle. <laughs> I got to watch you try that for the first time. And this this question comes from Anthony Radcliffe, by the way. <laughs> you guys don't want to know what mine is. Yes, we do. Absolutely. That's why we're here. Um, I'm not proud of this moment. Cabin still? There's nothing wrong with cabin still. Some of the old stuff is great. I mean, it's not good now, but like, I, I, I wasn't buying. I wasn't that. I wasn't buying the throwback stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. All right. So the next one we got, we actually got this guy in chat, Don Nishida. Once this is all over, what's one thing you will do differently from pre-COVID? Personally, I'll probably be less likely to go into the office when I'm sick, and definitely sick shame anyone that comes to work when they have a fever. Um, I'm gonna be honest. My life has not changed that much due to COVID. I get out every day. I still just as antisocial. Uh, so it's not it's not changed a ton. I guess if uh. If anything, I I won't call. I'll, I'll probably call in sick if I'm actually sick. Because I mean, I've taken maybe two sick days the entire time I've worked from seventeen on. So I mean, I miss seeing you guys a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely, probably try to hang out with friends more. I need to push myself out of my comfort zone a little. Yeah, I think that I would uh, be more willing to, you know, when somebody's like. Hey, you want to go out to dinner? Hey, you want to go get a drink? You want to, you know, anything that somebody has invited me to do, I think I would probably have more of a, yeah, man, I'll go do that. Whereas prior to the, to COVID-19, I would, I would more than likely go, Hey, got something mm. that I got to you know, do. Yeah. Sorry. No, I like, I, I kind of am the, the same way. The problem though, is that, um, I have a pregnant wife, and <laughs> I can't get out as much, and I don't feel I don't feel like I need to. I guess, That's but fair. that that being said, though, like I am very much looking forward to the day when you guys can, when we can all get together and record an episode together again. It seems like it's just been ages and i mean really it's been like two months so i'm looking i'm looking forward to to you know festivals coming back too i mean like the the thought of bourbon and beyond not happening sports true the but like the thought of bourbon and beyond not happening this year i mean like i'm just i'm so bummed about it man and like I, it, it, in terms of like what I would do differently, I think just <clears throat> being more aware of other people, just in general. That's you right. know, <clears throat> it's become so apparent how easy it is to transmit dis- disease or viruses between other people. So just it it is it has made me realize that there needs to be more compassion, I think. And I, I look forward to treating other people the way that I would hope they would treat me. So I can get on board with that. Uh the next one is from Steven Sussman. Would you rather live in the ocean or on the moon? Um, Ooh. I'm going to go with the moon. It's made out of cheese and I get hungry. I'm going to go with the ocean because people can, uh, you know, lower bourbon down to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I'll go with the ocean because I feel like there's a lot more to be offered down there. And I mean, you can. Other than cheese. <laughs> yeah, you can capture your own food. You can, you know, maybe create a bubble so that you, you know, don't die of oxygen depletion. I don't know. Well, if we're if living, if, if we're being able to live down there, I think we'll we'll be all right with oxygen. I would I would go with the uh, I would go with the ocean personally. Yeah, I think ocean. 
I don't know, man. Space seems great. I've seen cats in uh in zero gravity. I have to imagine swans in zero gravity, but it would also be hilarious. Have you ever seen so laser cats? <laughs> no. <laughs> I need to. All right. What's your favorite nursery rhyme? Uh Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, for sure. I have a hard time and it's so morbid. But I know where this is going. Ring around the rosy. Yeah. I love that song, man. <laughs> I do. It, it's really fun to like tease in uh, like jams with a with a band or something. Like I don't know. It just seems it, it's so recognizable and it's fun. I don't know. I mean, it's not fun. It's about people dying of the plague. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you think? Uh, okay, I'm, actually, this. Uh, hold on. I'm sorry, Curtis. I don't mean to cut you off. I'm gonna let you it. finish. But this brings up an interesting question. Do you think that there will be a new Ring Around the Rosie that is written during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that kids, you know, 600 years from now will be singing? Because <laughs> I kind of hope that that would happen. And we... <laughs> I mean, just for reference, are you singing any nursery rhymes about the Spanish flu? I mean, that was, <laughs> that was 100 oh. years ago. I don't know. Am I? I don't. I don't think so. I don't. I mean, maybe I need to check the history on my nursery. I'm gonna have to look. Yeah. Kurt got really tickled by that. That was funny. It was good. That was good. (laughs) I'm gonna defer my uh, my song to Mother Goose. Swan. Oh, can't can't do it with the geese, man. They're (laughs) wild bunch. (laughs) Okay. All right, this one comes from Papa Ritter. Uh, for me, son. Oh, son, that's great. How long did it take to write, play, and record the theme for This Is My Bourbon podcast? Uh, I mean, I might be able to hum it or something and to just, like, edit it in there. I, I don't know. This is... You no. got a piano behind you. Yeah, uh, I can't play that. Um, there's, there's someone much more talented than me that lives with me that can play it, but I, I can't play it at all. We're just happy that you were able uh, to pick up your little swan feathers and create yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. I might be able to put it into uh, some sort of crazy filter from another episode and then just send it to Perry. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> All right, the last one's from Cole Boozer. Do you think we can convince Heaven Hill to make a four grand I play? freaking hope so, man. I sure hope so. I absolutely hope so. I would love to see something called like Blender Select from Heaven Hill that was just a four grain blend of some of their pre existing products. Swan. Um, Bullet's already got a product called Blender Select. But I mean, something like that, you know, like just the concept. It doesn't have to be called Blender Select, but it, I, I want to see. A blended product from them under any name, I guess. It's just, I don't know. It's a dream, you know? It's a dream. I would love to see a four grain product with them. We've kind of done proof of concept. Uh, Before, uh, there was a blend that was done uh, of regular Elijah Craig and regular Larceny. And then I think Elijah Craig barrel proof and Larceny barrel proof as well. So I, I think that there's something to be explored in that. I hope it happens. I'll get on the horn with Bernie Lovers, or we can. Please, please do. I'd love to even see people start submitting stuff on our Facebook group here of just four grain blends from Heaven Hill products they've made. Like what they think is good. Because I, I, I just, I mean, I'm all up for blending some stuff at home. What else am I doing in quarantine? getting really drunk (laughs) constantly (laughs) yeah yeah all right so we're going to the uh tips and bits section here which is uh so lovingly named for this one pointed ends and small pieces (laughs) i've been watching this show on netflix as a netflix original called love i've never been so in love frustrated oh. at a show it, it is like you you want to punch your tv screen it it's got paul rust in it uh phenomenal guy 
Oh, um, you told it, me it's... about this. Okay. Yes. I thought yeah. I thought you misspoke on Paul Rudd for a second, and I was like, what are no, you talking Paul about? No, Paul Rust. Yeah, Paul Rust. Yeah. But he's uh, he, he helped write the show, and he's also a main character in it. It, it is easy to binge watch that show, but it is it is going to frustrate you the entire time. I've never had a show evoke such like strong. I, I need to take a break emotions. Uh, so that that's definitely something to watch, especially since, again, what else are you doing right now? Yeah, for mine, uh, I am going to say, and this is going to be crazy, but Facebook Marketplace, man. So I am currently in the situation, I know, I'm currently in the situation of moving, and there is a lot of stuff I've got to, like, just get rid of and sell, and wow, they're like piranhas in that thing, (laughs) man. You, I I kid you not, I put up a two-end table just from Ikea. And I had at least 15 Jeez. people just go like, are these available? Are these available? Are these available? For I had two for $20. That's a great deal, too. No wonder people were jumping on it. <laughs> no, it's not. The, I can't, the end tables are $10 each originally. <laughs> oh. And I've had them for a solid... Almost five oh. years. Okay, never mind. Well, you did great. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad they jumped on him. Anyway, also washer and dryers. Literally anything, man. If you need to sell anything, get on Facebook. Dude, washers and dryers are so expensive. Like one of the biggest scams in the entire <laughs> market of the world. So uh, we've been watching a couple of things recently, myself and Lucy. The first was um, the Grand Budapest Hotel, which is a phenomenal Wes Anderson movie. Um, I it, it's so funny because we started it way back when we were in college, and for whatever reason, we just never finished it. And then we started talking about it again, and I was like, "We need to watch this movie," and we did, and. Oh my gosh. If Wes Anderson isn't a genius, I don't know what is. Also, I don't know if anybody has ever seen uh, the Fantastic Mr. Fox. That is one of my favorite movies of all time. Like, hands down. Me too. One of my favorite movies of all time. It's a stop motion animation uh, based on the Roald Dahl book. uh, And it is just so compelling and so entertaining and hilariously funny with an all-star cast, George Clooney as fantastic. Mr. Fox, uh, Owen Wilson is in there. Of course, Bill Murray, uh, who is in every Wes Anderson movie, um, just f- spectacular. I mean, I, I would probably own like every single edition of that movie if I could, but also, um, we started this week the TV edition of What We Do in the Shadows. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the original movie, which you should, because it is better. But the TV series is basically an extension of that idea. So what it is, is uh, vampires living in the 21st century. And they're trying to interact with the 21st century world, right? But it's also people who died in 1800s, 1700s, the 1200s. Like, they're they're still trying to adapt over these centuries to the changing of modern life. But it it, it is written by um, and, and produced by Taika Waititi who did uh, Jojo Rabbit and Thor Ragnarok. And I almost said what we do in the shadows again, which is the original movie. Um, but he, he's just a comedy genius and it, it's on Hulu, I believe, or maybe it's on Netflix. I can't, I can't remember, but yeah, it's on Hulu. The, the, I, I would recommend watching the original movie first 
and then getting into the show. Um, it's an it's an FX yes, original, correct? Correct. Which is on Hulu. Yes. Also, just going back to what you were saying on Wes Anderson, have you seen Isle of Dogs? You know what? I have not actually. Mm, if you love Mi- Fantastic Mr. Fox, you'll love this movie. Too. I I need I really need to watch Isle of Dogs. All right. So my first takeover has come to an end. This is the time where we plug ourselves. I don't know how to do this any different, so we're just going to do what we normally do. If you guys want to follow me, I'm on Instagram and Facebook at my bourbon finder. And if you want to follow me, I am on Instagram at KurtCon and on Twitter, Kurt underscore Con 15. And can I just say that I think this was a very successful first takeover um, of at least, you know, a couple more to happen. Curtis is going to be doing this soon, if not next week. I don't know at this point, man. Um, but Swan, well done. And it was Thanks, Swan I feel all good about along my titles. who is leading the show. <laughs> I pulled off the Scooby-Doo mask as I said that. Anyway, I thank you all so much, as always, for listening to This Is My Bourbon Podcast. If you want to follow me personally, I am at Pirater 1492 on all social media channels. If you want to follow the show, it is at My Bourbon Pod on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can give us a five-star rate and review on the iTunes podcast app. We will read out those reviews live on air you can leave us a voicemail for our barrel ring segment at 859-428-8253 and we'll listen to it and respond accordingly you can find all of our apparel and merchandise at bourbonshop.threadless.com i always say there's a sale going on there there usually is i'm sure there's one going on there right now as well You can become a part of our Facebook community at facebook.com and you just search for This Is My Bourbon Group and we'll get you in there. And then last but not least, you can become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash mybourbonpodcast for as little as a dollar a month. You can continue to support the show, keep the lights on in the studio, uh, which will eventually become a nursery here very soon after a baby is born into the uh, bear community. Cub? I don't know. What do we call it? The Ritter household? I don't know. There's yeah, so sure, names, fine. The, in, in, into the, the This Is My Bourbon podcast f- family. My wife's pregnant. We're having a baby. Whatever. Uh, thank you all so <laughs> Clean. Clean. <laughs> yeah, nailed it. Uh, at the uh, $2 tier, you get exclusive uh, posts not available to others. At $5, you get the pregame chats and the bonus episodes. And at $10, uh, you get the uh, monthly hangouts uh, with all of our uh, community supporters um, at that tier. Thank you all so much for listening to the show. Uh, Swan, thanks for taking over this week. This was a lot of fun, man. Yeah, thanks for letting me. I think we had some good samples. I think we did as well. Uh, We will see you all for next week's episode. But until then, I'm Perry. I'm Curtis. And I'm Swan. And this is my Bourbon Podcast.